also got Kirk Kesevi is not here, so we're going to have here Jessica Garner that will be uh, presenting on this behalf. So the title of the presentation is Novel Epigenetic Therapies Targeting Angiogenesis Modifying Metastasis by Regulated Epigenomes. I'm Jessica. I am a research associate from Pacific Medical Center of Hope. As you can see, I'm clearly not Dr. Nizami. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. He had an emergency come up. Uh, but I am here on his behalf uh, to represent our research institution, uh, Research Cancer Institute of America, uh, of which Dr. Nizami is the president. Uh, I'm going to present to you today uh, a protocol developed by Dr. Nizami over the past 10 years known as multi-targeted epigenetic therapy, or MTET. And this presentation specifically focuses on novel epigenetic therapies targeting angiogenesis and how we can modify metastasis by regulating the epigenome. So we're gonna have to switch gears a bit from the uh, prior presentations that you've heard, which more focus on the laboratory data and kind of put on our clinical hat here as we look at some of the clinical applications of uh, targeting epigenetics. So just a little background about the type of patients that uh, we see in our clinic. Most of these patients come to us with stage 4 uh, metastatic disease. They've already exhausted all conventional options. Uh, they've gone through the standard of care, had chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and failed these treatments and progressed despite um, having all of these conventional modalities. So by the time they get to us, um, they're usually in quite a critical condition and we uh, treat them with IV epigenetic therapy and uh, I think you'll see in our data that the, the results really speak for themselves. So let me start here by uh, telling you a little bit about how the therapy works. So as we all know very well, epigenetics obviously regulate the expression of our genes um, and a particular interest to us is how epigenetics regulate angiogenesis or the process of making new blood vessels. And we look at some markers that correlate with angiogenesis. Um, one uh, particular importance is uh, VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. Uh, we also look at CTCs, or circulatory tumor cells in the blood, as a way of monitoring uh, patients for metastasis and progression of their disease, as we see that these markers correlate with the patient's clinical outcome and overall survival. Obviously, treatment of cancer is very difficult due to the heterogeneity of the disease and the uh, genetic instability of cancer, uh, which is why it's so difficult to find one treatment that fits for all cancers across the board, uh, regardless of their location or uh, site of origin. So, basically, the, the idea is that um, solid tumors all have a common need for angiogenesis and increasing their, their blood supply in order for them to grow and metastasize. So it's been thought that if we target angiogenesis that we can reduce cancer progression and metastasis. Uh, of course the first drug that was approved conventionally for this was bevacizumab or avastin, which we're familiar with. It came out in 2004, initially approved for metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, while it works in, initially in improving progression-free survival, unfortunately that drug fails to really uh, translate into significant overall survival for the patients and really can't be used across uh, the different types of cancer. So for this reason, it makes our therapy on the epigenetic regulation of angiogenesis very interesting and relevant to the field of cancer, as this can be applied across, um, across the field of different types of cancers, as we know that epigenetics regulate crosstalk between uh, the tumor microenvironment. So the question, how exactly do epigenetics regulate and influence angiogenesis? Well, it's been shown in the literature that uh, ischemia and tissue hypoxia uh, increase methylation, which of course leads to increased uh, silencing of DNA promoter genes that are related to VEGF and uh, related signaling targets for angiogenesis. Uh, there's a protein called methyl CPG binding domain uh, 2, which some, maybe some of you are familiar with. 
Of course, it was uh, first identified in cardiovascular research as scientists were trying to understand why some patients are able to form collateral circulation in the presence of ischemia and hypoxia and others don't. So basically what research has shown is that if there is a, a deficiency of uh, the protein the, or it's silenced, then basically there's unrestricted VEGF and VEGF receptor 2, uh, which leads to increased angiogenesis. So basically, kind of in summary, what the evidence is uh, leading us to is that hypoxic stress increases angiogenesis, thus increasing further dissemination of the disease into the blood by circulatory tumor cells. Uh, we also see um, in the research that uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthase is also uh, responsive to epigenetic changes. As we see that with increased methylation, we typically see increased nitric oxide production. So interestingly enough, on the flip side of that, um, methylation may also regulate hypoxia through um, uh, the regulation of transcription of hypoxia-inducible factor, or HIF. Uh, one great example of this is in patients with renal cell carcinoma who frequently have alterations or mutations in their VHL gene. So basically, when we have mutated or methylated or silenced VHL, we have an inability to degrade hypoxia-inducible factor which is normally degraded by ubiquitination in the presence of oxygen. So as I said, when this is methylated or silenced, we have a basically increased uh, or upregulated HIF that can trigger downstream hypoxia response elements and be related to epidermal mesenchymal transition and to further angiogenesis. Uh, HIF is also important. It has several other interactions that we um, know about. It interacts with heat shock protein 90, which is a simple, essentially a chaperone protein uh, that when dysregulated can increase HIF. We also know that HIF uh, plays a role uh, with VEGF through its interaction with matrix metalloproteinases in bone marrow derived cells as it uh, cleaves VEGF into its active form that's able to uh, bind to receptors. So understanding now that cancers are very heterogeneous uh, makes them difficult to treat. Uh, we have to look further at cancer stem cells to understand uh, why we have growth and metastasis and uh, look at how the hypoxia influences this. So heat shock, pro or, uh, I'm sorry, hypoxia inducible factor, as I mentioned, is very important in this process as it leads to downstream uh, signaling to WNT, snail, and slug pathways, which influence and increase epidermal mesenchymal transition and increase the dissemination of CTCs into the peripheral blood. So our therapy, MTET, or multi-targeted epigenetic therapy, uh, is what influences uh, this epigenetic uh, influence of angiogenesis. Uh, as you're going to see in the next slides, you can see that um, VEGF correlates very closely to patient survival and outcome clinically, uh, as well as to the CTC findings. This is a slide of an ovarian cancer cell line that was treated with one of our epigenetic modifiers. Uh, as you can see, there's decreased migration and invasion. Uh, the top blue line, I don't think you can see it very well, but the top blue line here is the control. These others are um, the uh, concentration of the substance X treated epigenetic regulator, and you can see the decreased metastasis. So we took 100 cases that we pulled from our practice, uh, patients who were treated with this therapy, MTET, and um, looked at how they did with the epigenetic IV therapies. We looked at their markers of angiogenesis, such as uh, serum VEGF. We looked at their CTCs. Uh, we looked at some other labs to see how they did after IV therapy. And you will see that of 100 patients, 62% of these patients presented to us with no other options. They were stage four metastatic disseminated disease, uh, multiple micro and macro uh, metastatic lesions, and there were no conventional options left for them. Uh, they had failed all conventional options. The only thing left was possibly palliative chemotherapy or palliative care or hospice. 
So we looked at the following things to, to correlate their uh, clinical response to markers. So of course we looked at imaging, uh, PET scan. Uh, 58 of the 100 patients had PET scans pre and post therapy. And of those, 91% actually improved or had stabilized disease, which is an absolutely unheard of number when we're talking about metastatic cancer. Uh, we looked at serum VEGF, we looked at FGF2 or fibroblast growth factor, and interleukin 8 as markers of cancer stem cell activity and increased uh, epidermal mesenchymal transition. And we saw that 92% of those patients in whom we measured it had improved markers. We also, as I mentioned, looked at circulatory tumor cells, uh, which I'll show you in some of the case studies, uh, were completely eradicated from the blood in patients with known stage four disease. So our results, all of the patients treated improved beyond the standard of care expectations, and all had improvements in quality of life, as you'll see in these case studies. Uh, now the fun part, the cases. So our first patient, um, very sweet girl, she's a 29 year old female. Um, she's actually a med student, so she's very interested in telling us her uh, symptoms as she goes along with treatment. Uh, she was diagnosed in 2012 with melanoma, had an excise, they thought it was clear, did an MRI, no evidence of disease. Nine months later, she started having visual changes and the MRI showed um, metastatic lesions to the brain one of which was on the optic chiasm, of course, which is what was affecting her vision. Uh, she went and had immunophoresis with Dr. Lentz in Germany, uh, underwent conventional uh, treatments with interferon and uroboy. She had a craniotomy, she had a um, cyber knife to the remaining brain lesions, and was started on targeted therapy soon. And she presented to us after failing all of these treatments in, I believe it was April, uh, and she received IV epigenetic therapies, uh, 10 treatments. After just 10 treatments, her vision was back to normal, which was incredible. So that alone, of course, doesn't tell us what's going on, but it's a very good sign as we see her in the clinic daily and she has improved DCOG score and is feeling better. Uh, we measured her tumor markers. As you can see at the bottom there, the numbers are in bold. Neuron-specific analase was initially 45 and down to 9.2 in two weeks. That's 10 IVs. Uh, her interleukin-8, which I said is a marker of cancer stem cell activity, dropped initially from 64 to 27. Oh, I'm sorry, that's her lipid-associated salic acid that dropped. But her interleukin also dropped from 76 to 53. And her CTC showed an, an amazing response, which I'm going to show you here on the next slide. So we sent her blood off to BioFocus, which if you're not familiar, is a lab in Germany that identifies uh, circulatory tumor cells and does genetic analysis of them. And this is what came back. So you can see on your left here, that's the before. You can see the date at the top. It's 4-30-2014. Uh, and she has, you can see it from here, but overexpression of telomerase in the cells. And then on the right, you can see the date at the top. 5-21-2014, so this is literally three weeks later, and you can see at the bottom, no more telomerase and no indications for the presence of cancer cells in the blood. At this point, she had had 10 treatments. Pretty incredible results. Another patient with renal cell carcinoma, a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier with the, the very angiogenic nature of renal cell carcinoma, uh, this gentleman is a 67-year-old male. He was very healthy. He looked about 47. Uh, he came in with a mass that was found incidentally on ultrasound and proven on biopsy to be renal cell carcinoma. His initial labs, all of the markers for angiogenesis were elevated. His uh, VEGF was 248, just for reference. The normal is less than 115, the lower the better. Uh, his interleukin-8 was through the roof. It was 448. His D-dimer was elevated. His platelets were elevated. All of this leading to a very um, a picture of a lot of angiogenesis going on. So he also received the two-week uh, MTEP protocol, and after two weeks, uh, you'll see what happened to his uh, circulatory tumor cells. 
Uh, initially, uh, when he came to us, we sent off his blood to BioFocus before doing anything with him. You can see the date on this, 8-14-2014. He had overexpression of one protein called G250, uh, which is very interesting as it correlates to the aggressiveness and invasiveness of uh, the type of cancer. So afterwards, this uh, second one is dated 10-2-2014, no more G250. So, interesting response there. So what we learned from this is that GT, G250 at the CTC level, as they said, correlates with higher invasiveness and aggressiveness. So the epigenetic therapy actually changed the phenotypical expression of this renal cell carcinoma. There's a link there, you can read more about it if you're interested. Uh, third case, a patient with uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer. Um, this is a gentleman who came to us after months of abdominal pain, weight loss, uh, nausea, vomiting, jaundice, the whole nine yards. Of course, at the time uh, he was diagnosed, he already had liver meds. Uh, he was seen at Stanford. They offered him chemotherapy uh, and gave him a 5% chance of response. So as you can imagine, he was very discouraged by this. Uh, he actually came to our clinic because he was a friend of Dr. Nazami and worked with him prior and um, he decided he'd, he'd give us a try. Uh, he came in, couldn't eat, looked, didn't look too well, and after just two or three treatments, he began eating, feeling better, looking better, and I'll show you what happened with his labs here. So initially, his tumor marker for pancreatic cancer was elevated, CA-199 was 110. After two weeks, it dropped to 80. CEA was elevated at 6.4, dropped to 6.1. Lipid associated salic acid also dropped from 21 to 15, so normalized. Seropur 2 was elevated, it dropped from 17 to 11. Incidentally, his PSA was elevated and normalized after treatment. And his CTC, again, sent to BioFocus, showed complete response after 10 treatments. Just incredible. Um, he was, after he received a couple therapies with us, he, uh, we got the genetic analysis of his tumor back, and he was started on a chemotherapy protocol with Jim's Zarnabraxane, continued along with our epigenetic therapies. His markers further decreased, CDA-199 um, decreased again down to 64. He ended up going to have nano knife surgery on the remaining lesion, which he completed successfully. And as of uh, following up with this patient last week, he is in complete radiologic remission. Metastatic pancreatic cancer, unheard of. This is his CTC, you can see before. And after, let's see, so the date on the first one, 924, the date on the second, 115. No indications for the presence of cancer cells in the specimen. Another very interesting case, a woman with four different types of cancer, a very uh, wonderful woman. She's postmenopausal, invasive lobular carcinoma of the right breast, that's ER and PR positive, her two negative. Uh, she started with hormonal blockade in 2008, had a mastectomy, and then was found to have a left renal clear cell carcinoma uh, and had a resection. She also had her appendix removed at the time, which showed a mucinous uh, adenocarcinoma, and in the interim developed uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma, so interesting genetics there, four types of cancer in just a few years. Uh, she was referred to us um, as she had metastatic disease from her breast to her liver and her bones. And of course, as you can imagine, we got a PET scan on her which showed SUV activities just through the roof. Uh, the highest of uh, the SUV activities was more than 20. These were very FDG avid lesions, uh, very active. All of her tumor markers were elevated, CA-15-3, 27-29, and CEA. Uh, we ran a CTC by cell search on her, which uh, quantifies the number of uh, circulatory tumor cells in 7.5 mLs of blood. That number was 14 when she came to us. Uh, after a few weeks of treatment, you can see CA-15-3 dropped. Uh, all of the numbers dropped, basically, um, and as well as her PET scan improved after several months. Her SUV activities all decreased. You can see there uh, SUV activities of lesions that were in the thorax area dropped from 13.8 to 6.2 and 12.4 to 5.3. Uh, her FGF2, which correlates with uh, stem cell activity, was initially 10.5, down to 7.3, and then down to 4.8, which is normal. Uh, all of 
the tumor activities on PET scan dropped by 70 to 80 percent, and 90 percent of these lesions uh, had physiologic activity, so they all improved. Uh, this response obtained without any chemotherapies. The only therapy she had during this time was our therapy. Uh, at this point, she had been under our therapy for 84 days. So these are some pretty impressive PET scans. You can see the before uh, on the left here. You see all these really hot, bright white lesions uh, in the chest and afterwards completely gone. Of course, normal physiologic activity in the brain there, but all of the lesions basically disappeared. Again, you can see before and after, these images speak for themselves. The radiologist, of course, called us and said, what are you doing? What's going on? What's happening? Another patient with metastatic breast cancer, a 70-year-old female who came to us in uh, pretty bad shape. She was, of course, stage four uh, upon her arrival. She had this big uh, ulcerating tumor of the breast uh, that had discharged, was very painful. She had a malignant pleural effusion that she was having drained every week. It was producing at least two liters of bloody fluid. Uh, it, it was a mess. All of her markers were through the roof. You can see CA-15-3, above 1300, CA-27-29, 1047. Her VEGF, interestingly, very high, 231. Uh, CA-125 was elevated, LDH was elevated, CRP was elevated. Uh, you name it, it was elevated. She had failed IPT chemotherapy, um, and her pleural fluid, of course, had malignant cells. We sent it off for chemosensitivity testing. Of course, uh, having been through some multiple rounds of chemo, it came back resistant to all of our typical chemos that we would use. Uh, doxorubicin, navalbine, cytoxin, cisplatin, 5 mu you name it, she was resistant. Uh, so she received seven treatments, uh, and after just seven treatments, her labs, her markers sta stabilized. Uh, she continued with us at four treatments a week for three weeks. So after 16 uh, treatments, all of the numbers started to come down. Her um, CA-15-3 dropped from 1351 to 1115. You can see the numbers there in bold. All of these numbers decreased dramatically. So she continued treatment with us. Uh, her initial circulatory tumor cell count was seven, uh, down to two, and then zero after uh, multiple treatments. And her pleural fluid, of course, she continued to need to be tapped, but the amount decreased over time. Uh, her symptoms of having a, some pitting edema resolved after just a week. Uh, the pleural fluid drawn in September of 2013 was sent for cytology was negative for malignant cells. If you can see here, this is a graph showing her VEGF. This patient lived out of state, and as patients are, that she was sometimes non-compliant. So you can see when she left for an extended amount of time, her VEGF would go back up. She'd come back, get treatment, VEGF back down. So very successful uh, treatment uh, with a, a VEGF with these uh, novel epigenetic therapies, you can see by this graph. Same story with her circulatory tumor cells. It follows the VEGF. It correlates almost exactly as VEGF goes down, uh, CTCs go down. And again, you can see when the patient's uh, out of state and doesn't listen to recommendations, it goes back up. Here's her PET scan. Uh, as I said, she had this ulcerated mass in the breast. It was it was formed to the touch. It was painful for the patient. You can see it's lighting up very bright, very FDG avid and uh, on the other side, almost completely gone. Here it is again, very impressive, pre and post PET scan. Another patient with metastatic breast cancer, this is a young woman, 39, uh, HER2 positive breast cancer at this time, went through the conventional standard of care, thought she was in remission, but she was at a country music concert when she had a seizure, of course, uh, had an MRI, and turns out cancer's back, there's meds to the brain, uh, so she had whole brain radiation, was started on some therapies at Cancer, uh, cancer Centers of America, uh, had horrible toxicity from these chemotherapies, and was stage four, not doing well, not walking because of these brain lesions when she presented to us in November. Uh, her circulatory tumor cells, when she we first drew them when she first arrived, were 1,000. Just to give you an idea, that's 7.5 mLs of blood. The cutoff for reading the amount of circulatory tumor cells is 1,000. She had 1,000. 
so she was very advanced. She started our treatment with no side effects. Her initial VEGF was 150, it dropped to 75 immediately after two weeks of therapy. Uh, all of her uh, cancer markers decreased, her VEGF further dropped to 24. Uh, after 47 treatments, her CTC was down to uh, 56. So her CTC, we monitored it throughout treatment obviously, continued to decline. Uh, she stayed with us for a long time and got quite a few treatments. Uh, eventually, in May 2013, her CTC was 1. Uh, at this point, her duration of treatment had been 70 days. Uh, she had some pathology done that was negative for malignancy. Let's see. And her CTC done 116 2014 was 0. So this is 13 months after starting therapy with us from above the cutoff, above what's measurable, to zero circulatory tumor cells. Incredible response. So this is a graph that you have for markers. You can see as VEGF goes down, so does CTC, so do all of the other tumor markers. VEGF kind of drives it and leads the way here. Another case, I know we're running short of time here, but I'll go through it fast. Patient with metastatic colon cancer. Again, I'll show you the CTC before and after. Uh, the first one drawn 11-14, the second one drawn exactly two months later on 1-14-2015. Uh, you can see no indications of cancer cells in the blood. A patient with non-small cell lung cancer, similar story, um, had 15 of our treatments. Uh, initial CTC was positive. Uh, after therapy, no indications for the presence of cancer cells in the blood. Just incredible response. Another patient with pancreatic cancer, all of his markers were extremely elevated. Um, he came to us um, with abdominal pain, the whole nine yards, jaundice. Uh, all of his markers dropped. His markers were cancer stem cell activity drop, interleukin-8, uh, VEGF, all of these markers. After just 10 treatments, you can see what happened with the CTC. This is on 3-4 and then rechecked on 326. Uh, no indications for the presence of cancer cells in the blood. Uh, patient with prostate cancer, after he had a positive, a uh, very elevated transforming growth factor beta 1 of 7,840. Uh, after three treatments, it was down to 6,060. His PSA was initially 40, down to 14. Uh, his CTC was interestingly uh, positive for uh, C-mice overexpression. Afterwards, no C-mice. So uh, as we know, there's no targeted therapies, there's no drugs avail available at this time conventionally at least, that target C-mice, but we can see that these IV epigenetic therapies do just that as we see C-mice disappear from the specimen. Another case of a patient with metastatic renal cell cancer, uh, when she came in, her VEGF was 717. Uh, two weeks later, it was down to, I believe, 303. CTC again showed complete resolution. She and her CTC had positive G250 activity, uh, DNA methyltransferase was positive, histone acetylase was positive, C-mice was positive. All of these are targets of epigenetic therapy. All of these are targets that we've been talking about and hearing about today. And with this therapy, they're gone. They're eradicated from the blood. No indications for the presence of cancer cells. You can see here, this is the comparison of before and after of uh, C-mice. Last case, endometrial cancer, complete resolution in her CTC as well. You can see before and after, another comparison of before and after. And that's it. So in conclusion, uh, epigenetic therapies are what it's all about. It's why we're here today. Targeting uh, angiogenesis by epigenetic means obviously makes a difference in correlating with patient outcome and survival uh, clinically. And that's about it. Thank you so much for your time.